Welcome everyone to this episode of Outline, one of my favorite series that we put out. Outline is all about process. We take a single project and we dive into the process behind making that project happen. Our special guest is Mariam al Zubhani, who is a Yemeni Russian award winning journalist, filmmaker, curator, and educator based in the MENA region. She first pursued her passion for media during the 2011 Arab uprisings and co founded her first media media production. She is a two-time TEDx speaker and one of the first directors to utilize virtual reality to highlight stories from Yemen. Mariam holds a bachelor's degree in journalism and strategic communications from Northwestern University in 2019 and a postgraduate diploma in museum and gallery practice from the University College London in 2020. Mariam, welcome, welcome, welcome to this uh, conversation. Thank you, Mikey, for the kind introduction and for having me. I'm so happy to take part with this beautiful series with Africa. No, the pleasure is ours. So let's talk a little bit about your background. Um, you know, there's a lot of nouns in that, uh, in that bio, journalist, filmmaker, curator, educator. Um, but we're here to talk about your filmmaking. Um, but your film filmmaking is sort of journalistic in nature. Um, when did you first get attracted to the medium of film and to thinking about it as a tool for telling stories with sort of a journalistic bent? Yeah, Mikey, since we're talking about process here, let me take you on a journey with me. Yeah. Um, I didn't really start with media, unfortunately, just because in Yemen, we don't have the possibility like Lebanon, like Egypt, like maybe Tunisia of, of pursuing media at, as it is, you know, as an education, as something with core, more than just a, a face in front of TV, you know, reading something that is already prepared for. So to please my dad, I went for a medical field. So I was, I was studying clinical pharmacy. I almost graduated and then the war hit. And with that, I had to leave and, and for some destiny, Doha was my destination. And coming here, I decided to restart. Okay, this is a new opportunity. There are these amazing um, international universities based here at my fingertips with my Yemeni passport. That at the time with Donald Trump, I couldn't really you know, travel and go to many places, um, not only US, but other places as well. Restrictions for being Middle Eastern, for being Yemeni, et cetera. <laughs> so I don't know, it's a second chance in maybe life and second yeah. chance in education and passion. And I signed up for Northwestern University and I decided to go for journalism because I will have more substance there. But media work started before all of this, before ph pharmacy, before, before the, the studies from before. And it was self-learned in a way um, back in 2011. And then when I enrolled in Northwestern, I joined the Doha Film Institute, also based here in Qatar. Yeah. And from there, kind of reconnected with filmmaking. In a way, I try to find balance between journalism and film. It's not journalism nor purely cinema. It's always like trying to merge those worlds. I know many disagree with that. It should be like the like purest, either this or that. But um, I, I believe in bridging and, and kind of changing what's, what's the mainstream. And I hope that it's, it's successful throughout some of the works that I do. Yeah, I'm going to read one uh, sentence from your bio that I didn't read. Um, it says, through her work, Mediam attempts to shed light on the dangers of stereotyping the region in mainstream media and provides a counter viewpoint to showcase the equality and humanity. Um, how often do you feel like are you combating your own stereotypes when you start a project? Uh, a lot. Because my, my focus is mainly on, on Yemen and then on the region, um, I try to kind of counter narrate what, what is there about us, about our homes, about our culture, about who we are. I know and I understand stereotypes help people understand, you know, other cultures and maybe kind of guide. But if you solely depend on that, then you just destroy cultures, destroy the humanity of other, other nations. And that's what's happening um, to us as a whole, like the MENA or the Arab world, it's 
It's like one country. It's like we're all the same. We all eat the same, all dress the same, all speak the same. And if there is, if anyone dares to say that they're different or show that they're different, then that is the retaliation. Like, how come you're all the same? You have wars, disagreements, all the issues that you have, and that's it. Um, no room for us to be more and to assimilate as, you know, we're just humans at the end of the day. Of course, we'll be different. Um, in the same family, individuals are different. How about a whole continent or two continents? Um, yeah. yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, no, absolutely. Okay, let's get into what we're talking about today. Um, when we invited you on the series, I was really, really excited about focusing on a specific, uh, the process be behind making a specific film that you've produced and sort of uh, conceptualized, produced, directed. Um, tell us, for those who can't see the screen, tell us what this film is, the name and the idea behind it. Yeah, I don't know if I shared this before with you, Mikey, but this is a debut exclusive to Afikra. Um, this is... <laughs> This work has recently been fully completed, didn't premiere anywhere yet. So we're, we're waiting to hear good news from one of the festivals we applied to and to launch it from there. But yeah, I'm so honored to have it here. And um, yeah, the title is Musalim and Musalim is an Arabic word that means um, the one who lives in peace. And we, the team and I, we went about beekeeping as a vehicle to understand what is happening in Yemen. The, the nine minutes were filmed in three different cities. It was extremely difficult. The process took around two years to film and complete with all the delays due to the situation on the ground in Yemen, due to rain and like weather issues, due to COVID, all of that piled up. But these precious nine minutes like came through. And using 360 as a medium, it's a VR experience. It's not interactive, it's linear. So you just put the goggles and you live through the eyes and walk in, in the shoes of these two beekeepers, one in the capital, um, the occupied capital Sana'a and one in Hadramaut. The, the Hadramaut is one of the most famous places for the Yemeni honey. And if you don't know about Yemeni honey, please Google it. It's incredibly beneficial and amazing and there is nothing like it in the world. Um, so we're hoping to humanize what is happening on the ground and humanize is such a big word that I, I I dislike to use, but unfortunately we have to, just to bring proximities that, okay, hello, we're, we're humans. It's just a different situation that is difficult, but this, this does not mean that we're boxed within these doomed boxes forever. War goes in, in, and history repeats itself. It's just this time is unfortunate for us, but we're gonna get out of this. We're gonna get better, hopefully. So this is kind of the soul um, or yeah. in of the film. I, I love your comment about the word humanize. You know, I, I, it's funny because when you say, um, if I were to like humanize a table, that would make sense, right? Yeah, yeah. But to humanize a person is like, uh, it sounds it just sounds ridiculous, right? Um, okay, let's continue. Um, I am really, really excited. So let's talk about what were you doing before you started this? So this is the before section of the interview. I'll, I'll link it up to the, the bits we talked about in the introduction. So I kind of um, took a workshop with DFI, the Doha Film Institute in 2018. And that was my journey in documentary filmmaking. That was my first short film that ended up being very personal, dealing with loss of home, loss of oneself, loss of a child, unborn child, trying to restart in a new place. And many you might think if it's like approximately the same continent, they speak Arabic, it's a new country, but it's like similar. It's really hard to start anywhere new, far away from home, far away from your support. Knowing that that home is in ruins also does not help. Um, you're constantly dragged by this guilt. Yes, you might have better electricity, water, internet, but still your heart is, is shattered. So that was kind of my calling. I felt this, this is the way to heal. This is the way to process these memories. And this is the way to try to give back. And since 2018, um, I kind of thought that this is what I can do. So whenever I have free time, if I can invest my own savings, I go back home to film. 
And uh, since then, it's been a bunch of different experimental things, um, mm. all related to storytelling from Yemen. Cool. And the region. Okay, let's keep going. Yeah. So what was the first version of the name for this project? Because I love thinking about names. I feel like they, they really and quite literally define an idea. So when this first idea came to you, what was the first version of the name? I, I didn't have a name for the longest time. I almost gave up. It was so hard. There were like suggested names by the team. One of them was This is Yemen. And I understand where would this come from and how would they think that this, okay, it's, a, it's a, in a way a briefing of what's happening in, on the ground, right? Through the eyes of the beekeepers. Mm -hmm. But it felt generic, general. And then including the name Honey or Bees in the title, it's like very on the nose. So I don't know how, but the epiphany came of how the bees are working together and they're peaceful. Unless you bug them, they will not hurt you. Yeah. And similarly, Yemen and Yemenis were peaceful people. If you don't hurt someone, no one will hurt you back. It does not mean that it's okay to hurt back, but the logic is if things go normally, they will go normally. And it was this metaphor between bees and people working together, keeping busy, creating this amazing honey, having this beautiful landscape and, and land. It just came together. And having the name in Arabic was so much beautiful. So then we ended up with the explanation, Musalim, and then the English version, Musalim, the one who lives in peace. Amazing which I embarrassingly, embarrassingly don't have in the slides here. So I'm glad that you're saying it out loud. <laughs> but anyway, thanks for putting me on the spot. <laughs> okay, let's keep going. Um, so what's the moment that you decided, you actually decided to yourself, I'm doing a 360 uh, project on beekeeping. So um, this project came to me with the idea ready. Um, the people, it's, it's in collaboration with two UN entities actually. One is the UN Department of Peace Building in New York and the other one is working with the UN Special Envoy for Yemen based in Amman, Jordan. And they had in mind already the medium, which is 360 and that it's gonna be beekeeping. And um, for some reason, the project just dragged and, and they needed someone Yemeni, someone knows the place rather than a director from abroad who didn't understand what is happening, how to work with people inside, etc. And it ended up being me recommended to them because not many people work in 360. I believe I'm one of the first and maybe few that work in this. Um, and I happened to train a few young filmmakers slash journalists back in 2019 on using this technology. So I know people I can even work remotely with, you know, COVID disrupted so many things and encouraged remote work. This film is almost fully done remote and everyone who collaborated and worked on it is in a different country. Um, Wait a second. Hold on. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> we're going to get to this during the during part, but I'm so curious. So you physically never held a camera in Yemen for on this project? On this project, no. Ama amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. Wow. You're good. That's the perks of COVID, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, my, my Google Home thing started exp exploding. Um, okay, let's keep on going. So uh, I mean, you kind of you kind of mentioned this already, but um, I'm curious, how much did you know about beekeeping aside from like the stuff that you would see in an airport bookstore? Like how much did you actually know about the process of beekeeping and sort of Yemeni honey beforehand? Um, the only thing I knew is how it tastes because I love Yemeni honey, but like nothing. And, and for, for storytellers, we do have, to do research and to talk to experts and, and all of that happened, of course. But then it's nine minutes, Mikey, right? So what do you include and what do you exclude? How much yeah. do you want of technical details of the benefits and the scientific part of beekeeping? And how much is it to the human experience of these beekeepers, the challenges they're facing? Why did they go into this amidst war? Um, when people are dropping, trying to leave, to migrate, instead they decided to pick up and start a business, beekeeping. Yeah. Um, so it was focusing on that aspect more than um, things that people could, if they're curious, just could find on Google. Yeah. Okay. 
we already sort of talked about this, but um, what are some of the things that created friction that slowed you down before you st before you got started? Um, there was the hard part of how do you communicate with um, people on the ground while being away. Although I go frequently, I understand the situation, how hectic it was to film in one of the cities it was more difficult than the other two. Um, but also how to explain the style of filmmaking remotely with with like people who are used to certain way of doing things and that's it. They they don't know how to shift into different style. Like um, filming in 360 meaning different angles because you're covering all 360. It's not like you can control, right? And when you go with the mindset of filming in 360 as if it's 2D or regular film, it does not work. It How do you even storyboard for something like that? There you go. You need something that is worth telling in 360 and needs to be exciting and interesting with information happening all around. If not, then you're wasting an opportunity of this tool. Then why are you choosing this tool over the regular filming? What is the answer to that? The answer is if you're using this technology, use it to the fullest. Don't just implement whatever you're used to without thinking how to adapt it and change it to, to, to best utilize this, this experience. But, okay, so let me ask you a question. You remember, remember in the 90s or early 2000s when like 3D animated movies started coming out and oh. every one of them had that scene where the guy yeah, <laughs> the yeah, yeah. goes more like, whoa, <laughs> you remember that? <laughs> At some point it started to feel like a gimmick, right? At some point yeah. you're like, all right, that didn't have to happen. You're, you're using the, it's not, you're, sh you're, you're including that because you can, right? So how do you avoid it from being a gimmick? Um, each project is different. So for this one, we ended up not using many of the footage that, that the people who really believed it needs to be filmed in a certain way, I, I decided to compromise. I'm like, great. So do go about it as you think it should be filmed, but also please provide me with this footage because editing happened um, outside. The editor is actually based in, in Brazil. God bless his soul. He's incredible. But yeah, then, the, then you go that the time difference, um, all of that plays a role. And uh, there is this issue of awful internet connection in Yemen. So to get this footage that is filmed in almost 5K, you need a someone who's traveling, someone who's going there to pick it up. Um, but then you go to try to understand why the people on the ground not wanting to work in a certain way. And then, okay, how about we compromise? Provide me with this and with this. I appreciate the, the extra time that you put. But if you really feel strongly, this will support the film, go ahead. And it's always a case of collaboration. It's not a case of I'm working and you're working for me. It's, it's never like that in storytelling. We're all doing it together. So... We're all investing in this. If you yeah. believe strongly in this, then do it. Go ahead, but please also do the other part. And it, it okay. works eventually. Amazing. All right. So one of my favorite questions to ask in the series is, is it that somebody had to do this project or that you had to do this? Um, in this case, I ended up having to do it, but because I really wanted to, wanted to if that makes sense. So yeah. there was no one else, but I genuinely, like, I believe I even spent days on without being paid just working on this because i felt there is a there is a responsibility i am yemeni this is my home and if this ends up being taken to policymakers, people who actually have say in what's happening in yemen and the next time they sign a paper that decides the fate of 30 million people they will think twice because they've assimilated with this place they've been in this place somehow and mm -hmm. they kind of even a little bit understand that there is a human, there is a Muhammad or Amatullah I'm invested in, in the next time I make a decision. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about, um, if you were to explain this project, um, what you hope people walk away from with this project or what you hoped people would walk away from um, to like a 15-year-old, what do you think, you know, what was, what are you trying to get done? Um, first of all, I want to create this emotional attachment. So a 15 year old or a 50 year old watching it to have this connection with the place. 
Yemen in, 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 in so many ways, it's magical. It has so many places that people don't even know and deprived to go and visit because of what's happening, right? So if you can't physically step foot and visit it, at least you can do it virtually. And if you're doing it virtually, then how will you connect with it? That was the whole idea of these nine minutes to emotionally connect people with the experience, with what they hear, what they see and what they feel. And then the next time they hear anything about Yemen, they'd be more invested in searching it or, or raising their voice and saying, okay, I, I can do maybe something about it or as little as spread awareness, or I at least know what is this place. Yeah, amazing. Okay, let's get into the making. We've done a bunch of these questions already, um, but uh, let's say aside from um, the people, the sort of the UN agencies that were putting this together, who were some of the early believers that helped actually shape the way this, this came together? Um, well, it was actually the collaborators that came later. Like in, in this case, the question could be answered in reverse. Yeah. Like the collaboration with the editor who honestly gave his all throughout. And even when we stopped, we finished, we completed the film recently. He's been texting me, but he's also a close friend. He's been texting me like, Maryam, something is missing. And like we finished working on Masala, which it was a huge part of my, my week to week, day, day to day. Um, and again, he never stepped foot in Yemen. We met in 2019 in Berlin in a film festival, and I never thought we'd collaborate and work together. But there you go. He has this yeah. huge love now for Yemen, and he really wants to come in and visit. Amazing. Okay, this is perfect. So let's think about the phases. Let's say I want to start a, a, a 360 project in a country that I'm not planning on going to film in with an editor in another country. What are the sort of the phases? What was uh, the, the, the phases of ideation to where we are now? Let, let's have an example of Beirut. Let's have an example of where you are now and if you want to film something in Beirut. Unfortunately, in the region, we don't know what's going to last for the next day, how things are changing very swiftly, right? So if you have a place that you feel is extremely of extreme importance to you personally, not, not to make it too whole like Beirut, but you personally, and you feel like you want to capture that and document it, and whether you just film it in several different time frames or you just go about it and film someone who represents the spirit of the place i don't know someone who sings there someone who sells something there someone who just sits there and fish or, or i don't know just sits there and watches the sea and you capture this footage and you just create a story of what does this place means and why do you want to preserve it for someone to watch in a year two five or ten or maybe yourself to watch and experience it and be like nostalgic about it if you travel somewhere else if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. Okay, I'm going to ask you a question that's not part of the slides. Um, can you just tell me, like, from a nuts and bolts perspective, how do you actually film this thing? So, if I, what does the film crew look like? Is it just a, a guy with one of those cameras that <laughs> just walking around, keeping himself out of, or herself out of the frame? And I mean, which way is front? Um, tell me. <laughs> I'm I lost. I got you. No, no, I got you. It's a really good question. So I'll yeah. tell you. Um, definitely, you need to leave the camera and run. You cannot be in the frame or like yeah. sit behind one of the walls. And it's usually smaller than this phone. It's like like one, one quarter of it or one third of it. And it has cameras on both sides. This is like the basic one. You have other types that have like eight cameras. That's... So it's like two level. GoPros back to back. Hundred percent. And GoPro actually have an addition of 360. So when you position it, you make sure that you don't have the, the stitching part in the area where the action is happening. So either this side or this side. Yeah. The tripod is as thin as possible because then you remove it in editing. So you don't see a tripod as much as, as possible. And then the person filming would be filming from the phone. So you disappear behind one of the walls and it's a Bluetooth thing. You can check the image from the phone, start filming keep it rolling and then come back and and hopefully nobody snitches the camera because this is also an issue when you leave it in the markets and it happened like we have some footage of that some people might just pass by and grab it like it's nothing like you know it's a camera in the street <laughs> so this is one of the challenges but uh, yeah it's it's different filming you're not attached to the camera all the time 
is it, I mean, but are you telling as a, as a producer or as a director, what is your direction? What does direction actually look like in this type of, in this type of case, in this type of uh, production? Yeah, so when you're remote and there is no internet connection all the time, it's hard to be there within that shot and like yeah. tell the person exactly where to put it. And that's also one of the main challenges, at least that I faced with one production company. Um, but what happened is I create a shot list and based on the understanding from the research, from the interview with the character, the main characters that are the drive in a way, I understand what are the places they go to because I am from there. I know these spaces as well. And I had an assistant director in this city in Sana'a that will go there, take photos, tell me like these are the places we're filming. She will be there. She will be my eyes as well because I trained her. So she will know where to put what, how to follow. And hiccups will happen normally, even if I'm there in person. So reshoots are important. Patience is important. Um, since it's documentary, you try your best not to exhaust the character. They're not acting. It needs to be natural. You need to work with their schedule. Um, so all of these play a role. All of these play, play, play a role in, in like getting the footage together. Yeah. What were some of the, I, I changed the slide just to be able to see some of the other imagery, but what were some of the like major failures or turning points where like, ah, oh, damn, we got to make a different movie? Well, it didn't happen to the point of let's make a different movie, thankfully. Um, in documentary, see, in documentary, you, you learn to embrace the chaos. It will always turn around to be something completely different and it's normal, it's okay. It's a matter of paper editing, like storyboard changing throughout until you receive the footage and even then everything keeps changing. Um, and you try to make sense out of yeah. this chaos and, and make it look together. Could it have been a non-360 film? Could you have made the film without making it 360? Absolutely, but for the purpose that this film is made, no. Because you're basically inviting people, the, the target, the main audience for this film are policymakers in the US that never heard, understood where Yemen is, right? So how do you make them walk like in the street of Yemeni? Exactly, yeah. experience it and be there. This is the way. With the goggles, you you are fully immersed. It's as if literally, if if you're if you're falling or if the car is moving, you feel the motion sickness. Like you are literally on the ground. So yeah. for the purpose of of what we want with the main target audience, this is the the, the tool. Mm. Okay, cool. All right, so let's. Um, if you were to give yourself some advice, um, if you were to have sort of like a time traveled and said hey this is useful <laughs> yeah. what advice would you have given yourself before you started the project um patience the timeline will stretch and stretch several times and it's okay just be patient push through it's okay um definitely these like keep being persistent and patient yeah okay let's go to after um so just i guess tell me if you can, I'm going to go off script a little bit. If you can, um, how can I see the film? When um, will I be able to see the film? Well, it, it, it needs to go through a festival circuit just because okay. it will bring more exposure. Uh, we're mm -hmm. hoping for an A-list festival to select it throughout the coming year. Yeah. So hopefully, fingers crossed. Um, after that, it will go through like a few, I don't know, festival rounds. It will be also screened in closed um, sessions related to Yemen with policymakers, which are again, the primary audience. And after that, it will be available for everyone to watch online. So hopefully by next year, end of next year, it will be available. Is it something that if I didn't have goggles, it's not worth watching? Not true. You can still scroll through it, but it's yeah. not the same experience. So you can yeah. scroll with the mouse on your laptop or computer. You can, with the phone, like yeah. scroll or flip through. <coughs> Sorry. But the best way to experience it is with the goggles. Can I ask another super question? No, no. Are, super all, are all goggles created equal? No, just like nothing is equal <laughs> in this life. Okay, so tell me what I should, because I've, I've never worn them. I don't know. I don't know the experience. 
Okay, well, the most basic one are Amazon cardboards, literally less than $10. Anyone can purchase them online. And then you just structure it and put the phone. So you're viewing basically with the phone and that will be your case. And this is yeah. the cheapest, most affordable um, uh, goggles in a way. Then you have a bit more sophisticated, they're plastic, they're also designated for certain phones. Just make sure, is it iPhone, is it Android, is it whatever type it is. And then you have the more sophisticated ones, the Oculus yeah. family. And um, let me actually show you because I have one. Um, yeah, this is the one I test with. Oh my God, they look cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is, there is an even more advanced editions from these. But basically, you just put it on and you're fully immersed. It's, 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 it takes you to another world. And then you can plug in the headphones. Yeah. or without it as well. And the sound design for the film allows you to follow certain sounds. So if you're away from the from Muhammad, for example, who's talking, you can hear the bees more. So the, the, oh. the sound is immersive. So it's also it's also um, recorded in 3D, um, like a, a, audio, or is, it, is that in post-production you guys do that? So anything recorded in the camera itself, it's spatial audio. So it is all surround sound, um, but the interview recordings, the music, this is stereo. So there is a mix of both. So the environmental sound, yes, you can like, it follows you around, but the music, the, 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 the voice and the dubbing, it's dubbed just because it's awkward to, to read subtitles in the goggles, to enjoy the experience and try to read, it's a lot. So it's yeah. dubbed with the original voices being heard. Uh, adapt to English. So there is an Arabic version, there is an adapt to English version. And um, yeah. So let me ask you another question. Sorry, uh, because I've never experienced this type of movie. If uh, somebody walks, if okay, so let's say <laughs> I'm watching it and I turn around and I'm not really <laughs> facing front. The whole movie, I'm not facing front. And I take off my glasses. Are you like, Mikey, you watched it wrong? Oh, no. You, you, is there a wrong way to watch it? There is, there is no wrong way to watch it. So in, in this in this specific film, what we tried to do, just because our audience are middle-aged men who might not be comfortable walking, because you get scared. You feel like you're walking in that actual space. Some people freeze and maximum will just turn around and look up and down, but yeah. will not walk. Yeah. But in case you turn around to any other direction, it's okay. Like you can still follow the action. If people are walking, you naturally will follow them to watch them. Right. Yeah. If there is a movement, you naturally, as if it's 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 like right now sitting and someone passes by next to you, you will look at them. Yeah. So it's it's the same way. It's the same thing in a way. Okay. Changing subjects from the sort of the filmmaking um, to the content of the film. Um, what is the big takeaway that you want policymakers to understand about what honey used to mean? to Yemen, what it means to Yemen now, and the risk, the risks facing, the, uh, the risks that the industry is facing, um, and what it might turn into if these risks are not taken seriously. Oh, yeah, due to the war, there are so many things that got affected. The very poor, already poor um, economical in infrastructure, the collapse of the currency, things that are happening in, in countries of conflict, right? Similar to Lebanon, similar to Ukraine now and many others. And um, the thing is, there are no proper hospitals or clinics for you to go to. So Yemenis depend a lot on natural remedies, including honey. Honey supports immunity, so during COVID, uh, people, the demand on honey was was way, way higher than before. And it became even more expensive that not everyone can afford it. And this is actually what sparked the interest for Amat al Latif, one of the protagonists in the film, to start her business of trying to um, cultivate bees and, and be a beekeeper to provide honey at a fair price for everyone to be able to afford. This is kind of her uh, entrepreneurial dream to, to in the future. Um, so if this thing that is hugely beneficial health-wise, one of the few sources that Yemenis still have is gone, then what is left, right? There is scarcity in food, yes. There is scarcity in so many other, other, other things. Um, but honey is not only good because it is honey, but Yemeni honey has so many benefits that don't exist in, in many other places in the world. So it's, it's such a 
rare commodity in the world, but then it becomes even more rare with what is happening on the ground in Yemen. Yeah. The climate crisis has something to do with it as well. 100% it's been affecting, I think, the whole globe. Um, and even with the countries that are relatively stable with man-made disasters, let's say. Uh, how about with, with all the explosions, with all the... the um, what happens afterwards, after these... I don't know even how to describe them. It's, it's very painful, yeah. Yeah. Um, let's talk about what you are hoping for, for the film, the impact that the film is having. You've mentioned it already, sort of uh, moving the needle on the policy front, but how do you think of uh, uh, success um, for the film? What would make you really proud? Um, definitely, as you said, the, the actual changes in policies which affect people immediately on the ground. Um, this is number one. Uh, what will help with that as well, people, pushing from different countries as well. So if it gets a good publicity and festival circuits, that will kind of mobilize people who are able to push their governments, able to push just for awareness. Um, unfortunately, Yemen is one of these few countries that only comes up to the service in, in waves, whether certain agencies need to collect donations and then it's gone. A child dies out of starvation on bed um, that sparks a bit of interest. People reshare that image and then it's gone and etc. cetera. It's, it's nothing long-term, nothing impact, nothing development, nothing supporting people to be able to help themselves, but rather like asking for temporary, you know, petty, temporary money, monetary support. And that's it. And it's not helpful. It's been yeah. happening for years and it's going nowhere. All right. A couple more questions. So what did you fundamentally misunderstand about the, the about honey from Yemen before you started making this? I, I didn't know the amount of, of work in, in Quiet to do it. So one of the main conversations with the protagonist was how her queens die and how much she's attached to them because she, she thinks of bees as her kids, as her children. And then she's like, Maryam, my bees are sick. Maryam, the queen is not feeling good. Maryam, one of the queens died. I'm like, my heart it's was such like, a dramatic Shakespearean sentence. I know, right? And it's like, I didn't know how much effort goes into taking care of them. And bees are emotional creatures. They, they feel if you like care for them, they feel if the weather changes, if, if there isn't enough, you know, plants, certain plants for them to feed on, then they suffer. And it's like, I never, I never knew. Like we know Zena Nahawl, you know, we grew up with this famous cartoon. I don't know the name in English, I forgot. But like, I didn't, I didn't really think like, I don't see bees like cats or dogs. We get attached to them as pets, but she changed my mind completely. Wow. I had, <laughs> it's, it's like, I have a hard time wrapping my head around the, like somebody who's in tune to the mood swings of, of bees. Yeah, yeah. What do bees even look like when they're sad? I don't know. Maybe they buzz less or they like they don't fly the same. I just like I don't know. <laughs> they like they call in sick from work. They're like, Ugh. but they don't move as much because bees they they constantly are doing something right. Yeah. So you know that when the movement is less, when they're not as active, something is up. Yeah. Do you have any statistics that you can share or like some things that like on? to give a sense of the scale of the industry and how it may, may or may not have dipped or contracted in the last um, few years? And unfortunately, I don't have numbers to share yeah. like right now, right now, but and definitely you can find them if, if you search for them. But um, another thing that um, affected the beekeeping industry and also selling honey, exporting honey, is um, the lack of, of uh, petroleum, petrol, mm -hmm. gas, all of this. So you cannot really export them. And because inside Yemen, it, it's, it's hard to, to buy within good, good big quantities or people don't have that economic possibility to do that. So it was very helpful to export it at least to Saudi, you know, the closest place where in Saudi, yeah. many people are able to buy. And that hit the whole, you know, Yemeni honey industry even more. Yeah. Uh, so that was that was another another layer of hardship. 
Okay, let's talk about what's next for you and for this project. So it's going on the, inshallah, it's going on the, the festival circuit. Um, what else are you working on these days? Um, so currently I'm working on kind of end of production, entering post-production for my first feature documentary. And it's been very intense. It's also a heavy topic, also Yemen. Um, I, I cannot help it. It's, it's all I do. It's related to child soldiers. And it's, it's not, um, the title is Yalla Nalab Askara, let's play soldiers for now at least, this is what we're working with. And it's not a top down approach. It's not like my team and I, we want the kids to say certain things, just like it's in reportages and et cetera. We have this platform as filmmakers, storytellers, and we extend it to these kids who have their own voice to share what they're going through. The war is this, you know, awful machine that sucks everyone in and feeds itself. So it forces these kids to join the front lines. But why? There is this certain element of choice in a way, freedom of choice, even if it's small, these kids decide themselves to drop out from schools and join the front lines. And it is because it's, it became in a way kind of the only way to survive, to provide for themselves and their families. It's not that they want to, it's not that they really want to kill someone on the other side, whoever that is. And they genuinely, don't find any other way to provide. Well, um, is that going to be shot in 360 as well? No, <laughs> it will be so difficult to have 90 minutes in 360. <laughs> so this one will be um, regular to the um, feature film, hopefully for TV and for festivals. So two different cuts. Interesting. OK, cool. When do you think that's coming out? Within the timeline that we have, uh, hopefully end of year this year or early next year. But if the story requires more and we feel that it needs more, then we'll dedicate more effort to it. Okay. Well, I'm excited to, to inshallah, we'll have that part of the, the next season of Africa. I'd as well. be honored. I'd be so honored. <laughs> okay. Let's ask uh, four quick questions and then we'll open it up to the questions from the audience. The first one is What are you reading or watching right now? um okay i skip reading to watching what am i watching to be honest due to the amount of things that i work on that are very heavy uh, heavy topic focused i turn to netflix for very silly shows just no judgment a comic relief yeah, no judgment at all <laughs> yeah so one of my favorites that i'm re-watching is jane the virgin please don't judge no, but no judgment just, at all. <laughs> it's just somebody else's drama so i can like not think of of you know, heavy things related to our reality and just yeah. think of someone else's. It's so funny. Um, a few weeks ago, um, Eve Trout Powell, who is a professor at the University of Pennsylvania, who writes about slavery in Sudan and Egypt, on this question, she was, <laughs> she's like a very like scholarly, important person. And I was like, so what are you reading or watching right now? And she's like, Judge Mathis, which is like Judge Judy. <laughs> she's like, I never miss an episode. <laughs> Uh, I love it. So I understand. I no understand. judgment whatsoever. Um, okay. Who would you love to shadow for a day past or present? Oh my God. Um, this is a very corny, cheesy answer, but I'll forever answer it. It's Oprah Winfrey. I've been fascinated with her since I was in sixth grade. And my actual dream job that I imagined was to be a talk show host, but there, there you go. I'm a filmmaker instead. <laughs> hey. But, is, yeah. uh, life is long maybe if, if she's listening or watching please yeah. reach out gail, oh, oh, <laughs> gail <laughs> reach out, yeah. i mean mariam you were supposed to be a, a, a pharmacist right there you, go. <laughs> so you never know what you never know what you're going to be next life is funny um what do people most misunderstand about your work um yeah, I, I feel like until now, people don't understand what documentary is for. And I do everything. Like when I mentor and train, I do fiction, I do documentary, I do experimental and all of that. But kind of my main focus for now, at least, is, is documentary within my personal work. But um, there's like this limited understanding that documentary is this boring something about real life that is not interesting, that doesn't have imagination into it. Um, so yeah, I'm hoping to change that. <laughs> cool. And lastly, whose work do you admire or are inspired by? So many people. I, 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 I don't think I have a specific person, but 
it, I don't know why, for some reason, it's my mom, although my mom chose to be a housewife. Um, she never worked. She has master's degree in, in engineering, but she just decided to dedicate her time for us, like me and my siblings, because she grew up with her mom working all the time. So I admire that. That's, I don't know, taking that decision and sticking with it because I, sure. I don't think I'll be able to do it. But yeah. yeah. Cool. All right. So we have a question from Tamara. Tamara, if you want to unmute yourself, um, go ahead. Um, so I wondered if you could tell us a bit more about what specific issues there are for uh, beekeeping in Yemen. Um, so while you touched on um, the climate crisis that Mickey asked about, also the, um, of course, the conflict, I wondered if there's anything else that's different, because right away, myself and my daughter, who's watching this, Behind me, we, we noticed that the beekeepers are barely wearing any protection. And while while you said that they're they're pretty um, placid bees, that that could be the case in Yemen. They're not here around Oxfordshire. They they can be quite aggressive, particularly where we live. So so we were curious about what what else is different about beekeeping and whether it's all men, because the only slides we've seen are of men beekeeping. So whether there's any gender difference. Um, and again, in the UK, it's. I'd, I'd say it's pretty gender equal, actually. It's it's an, an even split of beekeepers that we tend to see. Um, so th those were two questions. Um, Mickey actually asked some of the other questions which I'd had lined up, which I was thinking of as we were going along as well about policymakers, et cetera. But if I'm allowed to just tag another, sorry, another question onto that as well would be with your future projects, um, which sound amazing, the young people in Yemen, et cetera. So would that also be aimed at US policymakers? And what about other more global policymakers in again in the UK or Europe um, and I wondered whether whether you have a wider ambition there as well to have a more global reach than the US policymakers and what difference that might make so sorry I've, I've just dumped a whole load of questions on you but it's such a fascinating talk it's this has been the, the most enriching hour I've had in weeks it's really been amazing to hear from you very inspirational so thank you don't worry, all questions are welcome. And please, if I miss something or not answer something fully, let me know. Um, let me start with the difficulties that they're facing. Um, in this in this nine minutes, we we had two main protagonists. Um, Amat al Latif is, is a female beekeeper. And you can see in one of the images uh, Mikey was sliding through. She's, uh, yeah, this one. She's there with her mom. Um, so her mom is kind of her main supporter. And it is very difficult to find female beekeepers because it's, it's mainly kind of done by men. This is so true. Um, and the thing is because it requires traveling from one area to the other. So Amat al-Latif is in the heart of the city, the occupied capital, Sana'a. And in Sana'a, there aren't enough these specific cedar trees that uh, the Yemeni bees feed on. So in certain seasons, they need to be taken, um, not only hers, but everyone who raises their bees in, in Sana'a and the outskirts of Sana'a, taken to the other side, sometimes to the, all the way to the south. Now you can imagine there is lack of fuel. That makes it extremely difficult. The roads are very damaged and not safe. There are checkpoints, sometimes explosions, sometimes just people cutting roads. There is lack of proper uh, income, so people are some of them leaning towards theft, et cetera, et cetera. Like so many insecure uh, related to safety. All of these kind of have different hurdles and obstacles. Um, now in the area where Muhammad is, this image that um, Mike is sharing, he is in the Southern part in one of the provinces closer to Oman. And there it's more of um, not, not at the heart of the city. So he has space, he has the plants, he has, all the environmental elements for the bees to thrive, he doesn't really need to move them from one place to the other, like, like Amat al Latif's case. And um, that area is actually the, has the most famous honey, uh, the tastiest honey as well. And they're closer to Saudi for that, you know, kind of international export and trade close to Oman. But again, these um, lack of fuel made it so difficult and expensive to transport them. Um, and if you don't transport in time to fill the shops in these countries, then they just, you know, opt out and buy it from somewhere else just to have their shops filled. It's at the end, it's a business, right? Um, 
internally people are not able to pay for, for the expensive price that the honey is at. In addition, that special, um, whether it's pests or like specific foods, nutrition, um, tools, houses, these uh, hives, they become expensive and also not almost non-existent in the market. So Amat al-Latif especially faced these issues in Sana'a because of this war and, and long transport from one city to the other, long transport from getting these um, equipment or elements from abroad, it became so difficult. And this is actually an image of a market in Hadramaut where Muhammad is the, the Yemeni beekeeper and they're selling it on the street. Um, these are honey, uh, what they call it, buckets or like honey, or something, but, but like containers. So honey containers, so they, they sell them there. In regards to why is it directed to US policymakers, in this case, in specific, it's not only to US policymakers. It happens that uh, the UN Department of um, Peace, Peace Building is based in New York, but um, the penholder for Yemen is actually in the UK. So maybe the first viewing for the policymakers might be held in the UK and not New York. So it depends really um, on, on where it would be possible. If it's in Netherlands, then it will be in Netherlands. It doesn't matter where they are. So they're, they're targeting them, whatever they be. For the film after, it's not the same story. It's not, it's not with the UN. It's personal. It's an, an investment from my side and my husband. And um, we got uh, kind of for now some grants and support from Al Jazeera Witness. Uh, to be like screened on, on TV later on with them. And then some, some support from the Doha Film Institute. We're still looking for more funds. We'll be pitching in several uh, documentary festivals, but we're also planning to do an impact. It's beautiful to have a cinematic image, but also what impact would it carry for that specific village that we're filming in, for that family that trusted us and let us in and we're filming their private personal stories. Um, and one of the things that we want to, to do or to find support to do is to establish sports in that area. The kids love football. They enjoy it so much. And even though with the war, sometimes they don't even find the ball to play, um, but they're so passionate that it's, it's something that could keep them potentially in school, could keep them away from the front lines. And it's something that could also involve the girls. There is huge segregation between girls and boys, but to have that facility for the girls' school even if it's closed, it's okay, like within their privacy and they can enjoy something to just, you know, de-stress and, and, and improve their skills and talents. That would be incredible. And another thing is filmmaking in that village where we're filming is very new. Our fixer slash assistant producer made a two hour Nollywood film completely shot with the phone and edited with the phone where he used actual tanks and actual like weaponry and filmed inside of of these, some of the very dangerous places, just because people were like, oh, he's, he's doing an action film, let's just support him. They didn't realize what film is or how to go about it. And the whole village worked with him. And then he had a screening for 500 people with people coming from other villages where he normalized a camera being in that village. Mind you, that village was at certain point controlled by Al-Qaeda and very conservative um, extremist groups where, where things were not as, as okay as they are right now and because of him we managed to go and film um, in that area so after including him as a team member he managed to go back to university now he's studying media in in the capital Aden in the temporary capital he is a huge part of the of the crew um, for the film and he's training his friends to also like how to properly use the boom to shoot sound how to properly use the camera to film an actual film not not just going about it um uh, with the phone, Nollywood way. Um, so that could be another outlet for these young men, but also maybe women, to have a source of income instead of guns, instead of the front lines, they have cameras that they film stories they're passionate about, but also they can turn into, you know, a source of income for themselves and their families and advance with it. Amazing. Tamara, thanks for the question. Mariam, thank you for the answers um, and thank you for your work. Uh, it's uh, really, really generous of you to share your time with us and I'm excited to see the, see the film very, very soon. If you come to Doha, Mikey, I'll, I'll give you like a private uh, screen. Even with that fancy, even with that fancy thing? Yeah, Amazing. yeah. Okay, I feel experienced. <laughs> I'm on my way. 
Okay, uh, this is going to show up on YouTube in good old 2D tomorrow <laughs> and uh, will be on our podcast tomorrow as well. Share it with any friends who care about Yemen, care about beekeeping, our documentary nerds. Um, Mariam, thanks so much. Thank you so much, Mike, for having me. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. All right, everybody, we'll see you tomorrow. We have a uh, conversation with Christina Riggs tomorrow about Egyptology and uh, those good old pyramids. All right, everybody. Bye.